Okay, Claude. So this I'm gonna get. This is the recording on the integumentary lecture the, that we um, didn't have time for in class on Monday. So integumentary um, system is the skin. Integument means skin. So we're gonna talk. This is a very brief lecture. We're just gonna basically talk about skin injuries and things like that. You'll learn a lot more about skin and anatomy and physiology with Mrs. King. I want to make sure to see. Okay. All right, so integumentary physical therapy. Okay, so this is um, treatment of patients with skin disorders, mostly burns and wounds. Um, you can get a wound management certification, wounds management specialization. Um, and work in wound care clinics. Um, Dr. D actually has her specialization as a wound care specialist. Um, she likes working on wounds and doing wound care. Um, a lot of wound care, it depends on the facility and where in the state and where you work. Some places wound care is done mostly by nurses, but some places it's done by PTs and nurses. So it just depends. Um, but it is still within our scope of practice to do. Now, this is not just treating. I'm not talking about wounds and burns that are just like first aid things they need. I'm talking about massive wounds and burns that are like life threatening, those kind of things. Um, so let's just talk. Let's give some different um, skin disorder assessment. So if you're doing a skin disorder assessment, um, you know, if you see your patient is red, they're red, puritis means itching, they got a rash, dry, excessive dry skin, especially if it's on one side of the body and not the other. Um, swelling can affect the skin, it can um, stretch it. Unusual skin grows, changing in color and temp, skin integrity. And skin integrity means, is it Is it, are there any open wounds, any foreign bodies around? Is it stretch, is it nice and pliable? Is it stretch back when you, the snap back when you stretch it? That kind of thing. Um, other things looks at, when you see excessive, excessive skin dryness, that usually indicates a systemic dysfunction, usually diabetes or thyroid problems. So if you see people, I see this a lot in public, especially in the summer. I see a lot of people walking around with shorts on, older adults, and they're and I I don't know how I notice it. I just do. Um, they always have a lot of dry skin on their lower legs, and that's that's indicative of diabetes or thyroid problems. And sometimes that's a lot of times that's like indicative of it. Hey, you've got something you need to get it checked, uh, something else checked out. But a lot of times people let that go because they just think they have dry skin and they just need to put lotion on. Now, if you have a change in skin color, if it turns blue or gray, which is called cyanosis, that means you've got a lack of oxygen to that part of the skin. So we, so we, and this is that's associated with either you're not getting, you're, there's either oxygen being cut off to that part of the body, or you've got a respiratory disorder and you've got too much carbon dioxide in your blood. And edema is swelling that we get. Um, edema can indicate circulatory problems from the heart, not, um, if the heart is weak, um, it won't be able to circulate all the blood all the time. And so some of that will pull in the lower extremities and stretch the skin out. Um, and renal, renal disease can cause you to have edema too and have a lot of swelling. Um, so when you have to talk about a, 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 a wound, this is kind of the nomenclature. So this is kind of how you discuss what a wound is. So they give you the location of the wound and they use bony landmarks. So they may say directly over the sacrum or two centimeters lateral to the left greater trochanter. They use land, bony landmarks. So we use, um, we use disposable rulers and sticks to measure the wound. Um, 
and they are in inches and centimeters. And so we have to measure the size, the, we have to measure the depth of the wound as, as, big, as well as how big open it is. And then sometimes you have to have a Q-tip swab because a lot of wounds will do what we call, and it's really nasty, it's called tunneling. And it's where the wound actually tunnels down deeper into the skin. Um, and you have to see how far the Q-tip can go in there before you, you hit resistance. Um, I know it sounds like that would hurt a lot and it probably does, but we have to do that. Um, drainage, like the color and the texture and odor. Um, any kind of, any kind of anything with um, drainage of a wound that's yellow or thick or has a foul smell is gonna be in, in indicative of infection. Um, if it's clear and shiny, then it's healing. Um, black skin is dead, that's necrotic. Red or pink skin is healing and healthy. So if you have a wound with a lot of pink skin, that means it's healing. If it's got a lot of yellow or white or dead skin, I mean, or black skin that's dead. Tissue color and temperature. So, you know, if, you're te if the temperature is cold, it's likely not getting enough blood flow. And you also have to in measure the evolved extremities girth tissue to make sure that the body is not atrophying and you're not losing too much stuff to the to the wound um, and keep measuring this since me, sen, uh, I'm sorry keep testing the sensation regularly around the wound to make sure that the infection is not taking away any of their sensation um, these are examples of first second third and fourth degree burns And I think I've got some pictures coming up. This is called the rule of nines. This is basically, this is an old system. This is the way they used to determine how much of a percentage of a person's body was covered in burns. Um, and you can look at the map at the, I'll just let you look at the map here. They have all the sections of the body that, um, mapped off into sections of nine. Mostly nine heads are heads can be a little bit more trunk is a little bit more um, palm is less. They do have a newer system now, which is a little bit more accurate. But a lot of places still do use the rule of the nines because it's so common and with widespread and commonly known. Um, so when you're doing wound care, um, you're going to be doing cleansing cleansing the wound with different chemicals and water. You're gonna be cutting away dead tissue and dead um, and getting rid of a lot of drainage. You're gonna be putting certain dressings on it that might have certain um, chemicals in them to help the wound heal faster. Um, we don't do a lot of ultraviolet light or anything anymore. That's more for what's more wound care that would be for um, I'm not talking about dermatological reasons, and that would be done by a dermatologist. But with all, but speaking of ultraviolet light, with burn care, with wounds, when you get a skin graft, you really cannot get any ultraviolet light because it's not, it's, it'll be very sensitive to the UV light. Um, when people are getting skin grafts, we still have to do gentle therex and stretches with them because the skin will, will adhere and tighten down in no time. Um, we have to teach them how to do their ADLs for skin and joint protection so they can protect their wound. But then if they have new, a new skin or healed skin or a skin graft, we have to protect, show them to protect that. Because he, even if a, a, a wound heals completely on its own with or without a skin graft, it'll never be as strong as the original skin. And that goes for any one of us, no matter what age. So like any scar that you have on your body, that scar is strong and it's not gonna bust, it's holding open, but it's not as strong as the original skin that was there before you had that scar. Um, we do use a lot of modalities to help soften up the tissue before we um, start to cut it away and to hopefully get it to some of the drainage to come out. So we use small whirlpools where they may put their legs or their arms down in the whirlpools, or they may actually have to have a full body whirlpool where they have to sit in warm circulating water. And we have pulp things that are called pulse lavage guns that shoot the water into the wound. 
Um, I've already said a lot of this. We have to do a lot of range of motion exercises with them because they will, they will get tight really, really fast. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute of people that didn't get that done. A lot of times they have to wear compression garments to prevent scarring and to prevent edema. We have to do a lot of strengthening and breathing exercises with these people because if they have any burns and um, they had skin grafts or any heel burns around their chest or their abdomen, it's going to make it harder for them to breathe because that skin, those scars are going to be tight. So we're going to have to do breathing exercises with them. Um, these are the different types of grafts that they give you for burns. So there's auto graft, which is just transferred from another part of the skin that they take from another part of your own body. Um, most grafts that we that humans get are either allografts or xenografts. Allografts are skin grafts that come, it's tissue that it comes from a, a deceased person. So somebody that just recently died and it's part of the organ transplant. When you die, when you trans, when you sign up to transplant your organs, they can take skin to um, do skin grafts for burn victims. Xenograft is skin from a pig. Xenograft means skin is a graft from another species, and it's almost always a pig um, because pigs and human humans are strangely genetically similar. So we don't have a lot of rejection from their skin. Um, they are using um, they are using um, fish skin and scales now to start using. Um, and they're using specifically tilapia, I guess, because tilapia is a cheap fish to farm and raise. But they're actually covering, after they clean the wound, they'll cover it with a big graft of like skin, of cleaned and sterile skin, skin and skin and scales. And that will stay on until it basically falls off. And then it'll be, the skin will be healed and hopefully healthy under that. They won't need another graft. Sometimes they'll have to get another small graft and maybe close in smaller areas. But the first one, usually if it, if it takes, it takes care of most everything. You can look that up on YouTube. It's pretty cool looking. First degree. We've all had a burn like this. These are second degree burns. These are probably caused by hot water. When you see a baby like that, that has that kind of burn, second degree, that's almost always from getting dunked in a bathtub that the water was too hot. This is a third degree. So you can start to see um, muscle is exposed. You start to see tissues exposed. Tendons are exposed. This is a third degree healed. And these guys were third and fourth degree. So these guys were before, are healed now. And this might even be the same person, I think, after a facial transplant. But the guy that doesn't have any eyes, he basically, he had his, all his eyes burned out. So it burned down to the skull level. So he burned his nerves out. He burned his skull all of the muscles for his eyes and everything. So he had, that was a fourth degree burn. Um, and this gentleman over here on the left, I'm on the right, that says I would never change the thing. He looks like he had a, that's a typical face transplant that they do now after somebody has like burned their whole face off. So that's why I think this might be, this two pictures might be the same person. Um, but they usually see he doesn't have eyes. I mean, they can't give him back new eyes. And, um, but they usually do have a droopy mouth a lot of times because they might have lost part of their mandible or something. But if you're going to have to look a little different the rest of your life, I would much rather look like him with a droopy face than something that is a little scary part for like, pardon that term. This is what we call escar. Now, this is probably not a fourth degree burn. This is probably second and third degree. But this is after the skin on the outside has died. So this is what we call necrotic skin or escar. So this all needs to come off. So this would need to come off like with um, probably the pulse water gun. Or you probably you can't put your whole head under a whirlpool for a while or you'll drown. So you can't do that. So they'll probably just have to soak it 
with like maybe warm claws or with other solvents and then just try it slowly let it peel and cut off but that's not going to be very comfortable for him he'll have to have a lot of pain medicine this now these are tragic pictures now these are all burns burn victims they're burn survivors that have healed many years after their after their burn but if you remember, I said that when people get skin grafts or burns, we have to do a lot of stretching and range of motion of that new skin or of that healed skin, because if it did, we don't, they're going to get contractures of that skin. And these are three really bad examples of what happens when you get, when you don't get when you have a burn and you get grafts and your skin heals and you don't get any kind of range of motion therapy. So you can see this guy in the left, the lower left side hand of this side of the screen. It looks like he just had his own, one arm burned, but his whole skin in his armpit is just, he doesn't have an armpit anymore. It's just all one big flap of skin. And that's, that's forever. That's there forever. Unless they surgically, go in there and do plastic surgery on it. Um, this kid in the center, this is horrible. I mean, he looks like he had a full body burn. I, I don't know. His, it looks like his burn on the, the other side of his neck was even worse. And so the skin pulled him down in that direction. And he's likely not able to pull his head up into a full direct, into a full upright position. And this little boy on the end looks like he had his neck and his chest and his stomach burned and it all just all that skin just shrunk down and healed together so his chin is getting pulled down toward his chest and so that's probably about as high as he can lift his head so these are really bad cases but I just wanted to drive the point home that skin contractures are forever and they're very very bad so we'll next semester in PTA techniques, when we're talking about modalities, we'll talk about compression and we'll talk about how that can help with burns and that can help get rid of that scarring and reduce it. And you usually have to wear compression garments for about a, the 20, 24 hours a day into, unless you're bathing for about a year, but it can, it makes a huge difference in those scars and it can make for any, and it can be for your face, your head, for full body, just for arm or leg, wherever you need it. Okay, so that is the end of our integumentary lecture. So send me questions if you have any.